Uh, as I promised, I will <clears throat> start with the uh, well. No. Is this sleep? Okay. Second. Yes. Uh, I hope to you see my screen, correct? Yes. Yes, very good. Uh, okay, as I promised, I will uh, tell a few words. Uh, by end of the last lecture, I uh, told you that I wanted also to show you some examples which are related to sedimentary basin evolution. And uh, that's why uh, I would like to start this lecture uh, with this part of the, I just will show some slides to you related to the simplest way, uh, which uh, we call the backward advection uh, technique, uh, which apply to sedimentary basin evolution. Uh, again, let me remind you that the backward advection means that it's, uh, you have a particle, which move with a, some specific uh, velocity, prescribed velocity, or the velocity which is calculated through some equations related to the dynamics of the um, uh, Earth. And uh, then you calculate it at the forward in time, or not calculate it, just uh, consider particle moving forward in time with uh, some velocity. And then uh, if you would like to reconstruct the history of these movements, you just uh, uh, move uh, this point to the back position with the same velocity, but the change of the sign of the velocity. This is possible only in the case when there is a uh, no diffusion of the temperature or the processes with a very, very little diffusion. That's why in this case, it is possible to do. The, what I will be speaking today, actually there are several problems and several inversions, but I have no time to uh, show it as a, another lecture. And, uh, but I wanted really to show you this sample also because it's a part of geodynamics, there is a, a sedimentary basin evolution. And it is also important because it's the sedimentary basins are related to the uh, uh, oil industry. And even today we are moving from the uh, non-hydrocarbon uh, energy to the uh, renewed energy uh, to preserve our uh, earth, to preserve our climate, definitely. And uh, nevertheless, it's uh, more than 50% of the hydrocarbons today are used, uh, well, sorry, uh, energy are used uh, uh, in terms of the hydrocarbon. That's why the science of the sedimentary basin developed dramatically during the uh, time period, uh, let's say uh, last century. And actually probably starting uh, by uh, end of the 19th century, early 20th century, when the oil and oil production becomes a part of industry. Uh, and at, uh, since that time, it was a great interest to understand how sedimentary basin evolves. Uh, well, uh, there are, uh, if we consider the salt diaphorism, uh, my question is, do you see uh, my full screen? Because it's, uh, I see the, my screen with the top, uh, you know, part, which is a mute, stop uh, values, and so I don't know how to um, leave it uh, from my screen. But I don't know, do you see my screen just the normal without any uh, uh, panels on the top? Yes. No any panel, great, thank you very much. Uh, because I don't see my... <laughs> The, the, the top line of my slides. I don't know how to uh, read off this uh, from my screen. But anyway, uh, we are speaking about the salt diaphorism. Why? Because it's uh, uh, many layers, not only salt, but also sometimes it's uh, layers with uh, lower density, uh, behave, uh, behave as a body which start to move uh, uh, with res uh, uh, as a response to the accumulation of the sediment on the top. Why it is less dense? That's a basic physical phenomenon here, and particularly in salt diaphragm, which is a density. Salt density is around 2, 2.1, 2.2. And the sedimentary uh, uh, the, 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 the density, or sediment density, which 
start, uh, uh, accumulates uh, on the top of the soil is a, normally it's a something like 2.4, 2.6. Uh, that's why if you have a two layered system, the relator law or gravitational instability take over uh, in this uh, so-called the stratified geological structure. And the uh, structure start to deform greatly. Why it is important actually? Because of the following. How to reconstruct the history of sedimentary basins? What means sedimentary basins for those who don't know? First of all, it is depression on the surface of the earth, which is started to be filled by sediments. If sediments are filled from the sides, uh, let's say normal way, which means that it's uh, one layer, the second layer, third layer, fourth layer, etc., and they are also stratified normally, meaning that it's uh, when the first layer comes with the density to 0.2, when the, the next layer comes, it comes with a less density normally, but because of the uh, the weight of this layer, the lower layer becomes a more uh, dense in terms of the, uh, it is actually not dense, density doesn't change. I'm talking about effective density because it is uh, also filled by the some pores and so on. And the porosity is changed of these layers. And then next layer, etc. When the normally, in geology, in geological uh, petroleum uh, the industry, they look at the profiles which they see. How they understand history? They take the first layer out and then they restore the whole structure upward because at that time, let's say, the layer was accumulated within the last 2 million years. And within the 2 million years, this is a, they put, uh, they, they, uh, they restore this uh, uh, sedimentary layers up for. It is a rather simple technique. It is called the backstripping analysis. But if we have uh, some layer, which is a ductile and swell as a lower density, this layer immediately start to move upward as soon as uh, some heterogeneity uh, in terms of the movements occur. Why? Again, because of the related law instability, which tells that if, uh, let's say, consider it's a very simple case, two layers, one on the top of other, and the top layer are denser than the low layer. And if there is a very small perturbation at the interface of these two layers, the low layer start to go upward because it wants to go up, it is a lighter and heavy layer will go down because it's heavier and structure which appears is called diapir. And salt exhibit exactly this behavior. That is why complications comes how to reconstruct the history of the sedimentary basin to uh, which complicated by deformation due to salt. And why restoration, why reconstruction of sedimentary basin? Because in this case, we know exactly the time, the uh, position of layers, and uh, let's say cal can calculate the temperature within layers and understand when the oil or gas started to be produced. Uh, as probably you heard, this oil and gas can be produced only at a specific pressure and temperature conditions. Mm -hmm. That's why it is very important to have a structural uh, history in one hand and the thermal history in another. Thermal history is uh, quite interesting, more complicated. That's why I will drop this part because I have no time. But it is a very close to what I already mentioned about the, uh, uh, let's say, thermal convection in the Earth. It's very similar, but it's uh, more complicated because it's, uh, uh, it is addition to the structural evolution. Now I will be speaking about the structural uh, evolution. And there is a basic component that's written here. It is a gravity. It is isostasy and the differential loading. Do you know what means isostasy? I think so. It is a, just a compensation due to the masses, which is a, uh, uh, um, uh, operating uh, within the uh, Earth structures. It is a, it's a some, some position of the normal uh, to the, to the uh, uh, surface, let's say. And differential loading is the following. If it's from one side, you have a big pile of sediments from another side, smaller pile of sediment, 
That is the differential loading to the sedimentary base. Finally, <clears throat> it is a mathematical problem of the salt diaperism described by a set of, of equations. And it's a very simple equation. It's again Stokes equation principally and the, uh, uh, the incompressibility equation or it's called motion and continuity equation as is written here. And uh, uh, in this case, we have a no thermal equation because it is the other part of the research related to the thermal history. Now we are talking about structural history. And within the structural history, we consider only now we are Stokes equation to be coupled with the advection of density and viscosity. Advection is definite, definitely is present because of the uh, dynamic, uh, dynamics of the system. Because it's, uh, it should advect the density and viscosity, advect it with the equation. Or we can consider that heat also can be advected, but we have to remember that in this case, Heat is only uh, conductive. It is, uh, oh, sorry, it is uh, 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 only the part which is an uh, advective heat, not a heat which is a diffuse. So, um, in this case, uh, we we can solve that problem. But, uh, this is uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, known uh, techniques which comes from the uh, American uh, uh, geologist uh, uh, Schultz Ella. Uh, or who were working for the oil industry and so on. And how normally uh, the, the, the geologist reconstructs the history. Uh, lo look here at the starting configuration where it is written. It's uh, uh, below is a salt and on the top are layers and the layers are fractured. There are a faults, uh, some it's a listric fault, some it's a just a uh, uh, trusting faults, etc. But anyway, it is a fault which uh, the geologists want to reconstruct. What they are doing, they take uh, this uh, green one, look down now, strip. It's, as I mentioned, it is a basically stripping analysis, yeah? This is, they took this one, and then they start to unfold layers. But it is a, something like a handmade, you know? They are unfold each the layers, then they rotate these layers. It is a, on the uh, um, right top. They rotate this layer, they rotate it, then they move this layer toward the uh, left to align with the previous, uh, with the, uh, the layer here. And uh, finally, they decompact them. They compact because of the porosity, the, uh, the reason the sediments, and then they compact the porosity uh, increase and it's uh, then it's uh, uh, sorry porosity decrease and when they they decompact the porosity increase and then the volume looks like uh, bigger and they are doing the same way the same way doing this way actually they ignore dynamics of the salt look what they are doing they cut salt from here again by hand put here and so, but look here, so a big amount of salt was here. At this area, salt disappeared somewhere. It's also, it's, you know, the strange things, but anyway, it was a, a simple for the geologist to do such kind of reconstruction. When first time I saw it, I thought, oh my God, why it's uh, people, it's not uh, using this, some even simplest mathematical techniques which allows them easily to do such kind of the reconstruction with the deformed salt shapes. But it is, look, it is cartoon. But if you are going to the real area, and I will show the, uh, by end they say example real, it is not so simple, yeah, uh, to do this way because there are many interpretations. This is a, one of the interpretation how it was developed. But uh, there is, there is a something which you don't need a specific interpretation just to give a uh, nature to move uh, backward in time, no. Well, and this, uh, here I just uh, put that as object of this uh, study was to allow that uh, uh, they say, uh, not only they say uh, to use this geometrical reconstruction, but also to do some dynamic uh, the, uh, reconstruction where the, uh, we, we can see the salt mobility. And that's important. And we use uh, this uh, bad, uh, bad technique, which is a backward addiction. Uh, uh, technique uh, uh, and uh, well, this is a uh, method which you already know, I hope. 
Uh, let's show you a very simple uh, uh, sensitivity analysis, just uh, moving to the real example, which I will show you. Because it's the sensitivity analysis is important to understand how well we are reconstructing this, not just, uh, you know, <laughs> believe me, it is true. And uh, I, what I, I am doing, I will show you the how sensitive are results to restoration of small change in density, because it's again, it depends on the, what is the density of the uh, layer structure. And the second one, I will show when it is a diet, there is very mature. You know, what means mature? It is a, like, a, as I showed uh, in terms of the mantle plume, when they develop a structure as a mushroom structure, you know, the very long big overhangs or, or the uh, mushroom head and very thin and smaller, the part of the uh, uh, or tail of the diaphragm or plume. Uh, well, this, this is a, a first one when we consider the differences in the uh, area. This is a overburden. Everything what is uh, on the top of the salt, it is called in uh, structural geology overburden, overburden of salt. Yeah, and uh, this is a salt. And uh, initial initial position was uh, this way, this line, T equals zero. And then we made a forward uh, analysis and this moved to this line. And this after the, uh, some here is non-dimensional time, don't link to the specific time, but it's non-dimensional. And this is uh, uh, after the uh, about yeah, uh, 1,500,000. Uh, uh, time uh, steps. And uh, you can see that uh, now is a position that uh, we see it's a very prominent salt dome here or salt, salt, uh, uh, the diaper. And uh, here is a smaller salt diaper, but it is a because of the uh, relationship uh, of the wave number to the wavelength, etc. But it is a different story. And, uh, I just would like to show the sensitivity. Now, what we are doing, we did, we took this diaper and ran it backward in time to see the how how it developed. And as the moving is backward in time, we came to this position. I, and you don't see actually the very big differences, but I took this area, you see a very narrow area, and I zoomed this area here. And you see that is a change. And initial, initial, uh, the line was the line which is a here indicated by solid thin line. All other three lines are because of the differences in the density. And please note that density actually is something like a 2,000 uh, kilogram per square uh, per meter cube. And uh, that's why here it is a very small perturbation to the density. Nevertheless, you see that it is a, uh, that, that, that we, we have a uh, really very uh, good uh, performance of the algorithm. Another actual case, uh, sorry, yeah. Another case, it is about the maturity. It's not only to run to this position, but it's further. Uh, now, you see here, orange color is a forward modeling, and the uh, as, uh, blue color is a backward modeling. And uh, we, we start with this line, and then we are going to this position, which is a more, uh, close to the what I showed you. And this is the next time is here running for the, uh, for the direct problem. And because it's a time F, it is a time the forward modeling. Here, even more mature, even more mature. And that's the final position. From where we start the backward modeling. And the backward modeling starts from here and goes this way up to this position. And you see the differences. Here, a small orange area show the differences between the backward and forward modeling. Again, I can tell that it's a, for even a very mature structure that our method is a really perfect way of uh, working. I can tell that this is a uh, very specific method published in the, uh, some uh, literature and so on. Uh, by end of this lecture, I will show you some uh, um, the textbooks where you can uh, take these uh, methods which we developed for many years and so on. But anyway, 
the point is that it's uh, uh, the reconstruction is really very good when you have a more diffusion. And now I will show you uh, like a final point of this uh, uh, part. Uh, it is uh, uh, something which is from the nature. This is a seismic profile and uh, the experts uh, can recognize here there is a very remnant small diapirs and rather big diaper here. Also, it could be recognized the many layers of the sediment and it looks like a turtle back and so the other sediments here and here. Finally, it is possible, this is a time series, it is, uh, sorry, it is a time here, time, uh, seismic time, uh, profile, and then it is possible to convert it in the depths and the lengths. And in this case, you could see here, this is a salt layer here, there also, this is also salt layer, and this is a layers, all other layers are sediment layers. There is a, some description of this sediment. Actually, it is a taken from the, this profile taken from the very well known so, a basin, it's called Pre-Caspian Basin, it's uh, called here. There are many uh, uh, publications about this Pre-Caspian Basin. First of all, scientifically, it is an amazing basin because it uh, uh, con contains something like uh, 1,800 different diapirs and the uh, walls and the uh, uh, domes of the salt structures. Uh, moreover, there, is, uh, there are many giant oil and gas fields in this area. Again, it's a quite interesting topic to be discussed, and we did a lot of modeling, uh, thermal and the others, but now I would like to uh, tell you about the uh, um, inversions which we used. And uh, finally, what we did, we constructed, we took this model, we prepare this uh, kind of the layer system. This is uh, all color, uh, colors show the different layers. You see these uh, layers which uh, were accumulated something in the Paleocene uh, time were rather flat and uh, it is rather simple to uh, use the technique uh, which we call the backstrip analysis for them. But, as soon as we are going down to this area, the layers are deformed indeed by diapirs. And you will see now how salt dynamically change the configuration of the basin. And it will be a small movie related to this and you see how we reconstructed it. We first of all made them it's, uh, you know, they're to the stride horizon. Uh, and then we strip them out. We perform the analysis of normally applied by the backstripping analysis. But here you see the salt itself moves. It is a, not a just a, something like a, by hand we uh, make it the unfold the, them and then we adjust them. They are all continuously changing. They are looking how time ago it looked like, you know. And uh, this is this is a something. Uh, indeed, in some places you can see when we strip the uh, sediments, immediately there is a, some time of the fall. Indeed, it is not whole because a stripping is a permanent. Uh, it is a um, uh, instantaneous yeah, uh, function, but it it is a not instantaneous. It's a very small layers. If we could apply these, uh, you know, these small layers to, uh, I mean, it's this time, then it would be uh, something maybe two, three hours moving. That's why it is a, uh, you see something uh, which is uh, uh, sometimes it's like a deep, uh, um, uh, for, uh, I mean, it's a holes, but it is not actually. But anyway, you can see now the household move. And the, if you will run now this history back, you will see, oh, sorry, you will see that it is how mobile is salt and how the salt goes. It was initially, it is a, like a, a layer, horizontal layer you saw at the end of this movie. And then sediments start accumulate here, then here, then here. And the accumulation, this is differential, as I mentioned, differential loading really moves these diatheres upward because the salt is light. And that's uh, in this case, you 
could reconstruct this uh, area. And this is indeed important technique for the, um, for, for, for the oil company. And uh, for example, such companies like uh, Egypt and uh, um, uh, Epson Mobile, they were quite interesting in this technology and so on, and we'll work with them. Uh, sorry, uh, Exxon Mobile is a different area, but uh, with, with uh, Chevron company, we worked on this topic uh, for quite a while. When, and this is a last uh, sample which I wanted to show you. It is uh, uh, something which our reconstruction in three-dimensional case, because it's uh, on the top, you see the very large three-dimensional uh, structure within the same basin, Precaspian basin. And the question was, uh, how, how this very big dome developed. And we showed it was not developed from the big perturbation. It was developed from very small perturbations. But then these small uh, diapirs merged during the evolution and they become the very big dome. That was a quite interesting finding because it's the geologists sometimes believe that the big domes is because of the very big perturbation on the, uh, the uh, basis of the salt and the pre-salt. And that's, that's, you see that here small perturbation, which gave a rise to the big one. And here is the differences. Again, it's always we are interested in how well we can reconstruct. And then we are doing the forward analysis, this backward analysis, and then we check the how, how uh, the density residuals uh, was. Okay, well, I think that is all what I wanted to tell you uh, with this chapter, and I will stop now sharing. And before I will uh, go to the uh, main topic of this lecture, I would like to ask you if you have uh, questions related to this particular uh, to this particular um, the, the, the presentation related to. Uh, Okay, I now would like to share my screen. How the inversion of time to depths. What about? What means how the inversion of time to depths? Uh, Halisi, you can ask the question if you would like or explain it. How did you do? You mean how I converted seismic profile to depths? This is a special technique that I didn't make. Yes, I didn't make a something special. I mean, because it's a, this is a, uh, with profile and there is a special program for conversion. This is, I mean, I mean, it was not in my uh, the idea. Uh, I mean, it's my work to convert it. There is a special program which convert the lines of the seismic profiles into the density. Definitely, we need some information from boreholes to correct for densities, to correct for the thickness of layers and so on. Indeed, indeed, the borehole data are quite important. And it was used, uh, actually. Uh, in the Precaspian Basin, there are a lot of the data on the peripheral part of the basin, because the depth of the basin in the center more than 20 kilometers. There is a no borehole, which uh, <laughs> today, uh, I mean, it's a till today, it's a drilled in the center of the Precaspian Basin. It's really a very big basin, something like a 600 kilometers to 400 kilometers with the, uh, in the center, it's depths uh, uh, down uh, to the uh, 20 kilometers. But it's uh, information from borehole use definitely in doing such kind of things. Okay, now I share this screen. I hope you see this screen as well. Okay, uh, the title of the uh, lecture will be the uh, data simulation and the machine learning in the models of lava dynamics. Uh, I, I am very sorry that I had no time because you know there is my lecture was scheduled for tomorrow to bring this all in one file because uh, you will see there is several files, but now I will be speaking about the uh, lava flow and then I will be speaking about the lava domes in another file. I couldn't merge them because of no time. 
but anyway, anyway, this is, uh, let's start with this uh, uh, very interesting and exciting topic in uh, dynamics of the uh, Earth and the uh, volcano dynamics. Um, we probably you heard that it's uh, uh, during already about one month there is a very big uh, eruption in uh, the islands, Canarian Islands, and uh, well, it's damaging, uh, damaging infrastructure there and so on. And it's mostly, mostly the uh, uh, interesting part of the uh, dynamics of the uh, lava dome are the, uh, they are both temperature and this uh, uh, internal, uh, let's say, uh, crystallization. Oh, what means internal crystallization? Meaning that the crystallization depends on many factors, as well as the temperature. I will show you these things a little bit later, just an hour to tell. Uh, indeed, it is a, one of the exciting natural phenomena which we can see, and there are uh, even more. The lava flow sometimes they say, you know, the volcano just go so closely to them, just a few meters, uh, because it's uh, the flow of the lava is not a very fast. It is fast in many cases, but it is uh, when it's uh, already on the very long passes, it uh, uh, becomes a uh, colder, and you see already here it starts to be covered by the crust. Okay, let's let's uh, uh, first of all to tell this in general the structure of volcanoes for those who are not much familiar. And you know there is there's some uh, area just beneath uh, sometimes uh, volcano, sometimes a little bit shifted. It is so called the magma chamber, and it's uh, how to develop magma chamber. It is a special topic, and this is a very uh, exciting topic also. Uh, I will not be uh, speaking today about this uh, development or, or dynamics of magma within the magma chamber, but I will be mostly speaking about the surface processes which we observe. That's why we can use the observation to assimilate uh, uh, this uh, data into uh, understanding of the flow of the lava. And uh, here you see there's many things related to the, I mean, many terms related to the volcano dynamics. Particularly here you see ash clouds, and I am very happy that tomorrow we will hear the lecture of Professor Volch, and he's a well-known uh, expert in the area of the modeling of the ash clouds. And uh, he is uh, right now very busy, he, he's from Spain, he is from Barcelona, and he is uh, very uh, busy with uh, uh, this is a volcano, ongoing volcano. Nevertheless, he uh, promised to join us and to deliver tomorrow uh, the uh, lecture, and probably he will be speaking also about the uh, ongoing, ongoing eruptions at the Canary Island. Uh, today I will be speaking about the lava flow. You see here lava flows. It's a partially here seen, here seen, and later also I will be speaking about the uh, so-called the domes, which are effusive. Effusive meaning that uh, not an eruptive uh, volcan uh, volcanic uh, activity, but it's a rather slow, uh, which develops uh, this uh, uh, lava flows normally, or they can develop a dome. And I will show you this how later. Now, I will try to run this movie and I hope you will see the movie and I will explain. What is exciting, you see that it's a very hot material from the Earth's interior comes to the top of the surface and start to move. It's uh, created uh, the, the, on the top, it creates crust, which are uh, which can rupture suddenly at some places and the hot lava can come over. You see that it's the lava already and the top becomes a colder because of the conductive and the, uh, and mostly it's because radiative the heat flow which is occur. And then you uh, the, now it will be rupture you will see and there is a new lava will come and go. That's why one of the exciting point here at this particular, uh, they say, for, for, for me particularly, was to understand how really these lava flows, how the um, pieces of the 
uh, cross ruptures and they, uh, they flow, how they are accumulated on so. Uh, well, for this aim, we developed uh, some interaction of lava and crust models. Uh, this will, uh, will be direct problems. Uh, we are actually thinking and uh, working partly on the understanding how we can uh, resolve the problems of the also inverse problems. But um, uh, the practical meaning of inverse problems, let's say how from the crust to bring the crust backward, it is a maybe not a very uh, important in the volcanology. But still it's also information if you have a, information about your crust thickness and the crust pieces, is it possible to reconstruct, let's say, temperature in the past at the beginning of the eruption and so on. But what is a quite important thing in terms of the inverse problem is dynamics of lava flow inside a channel. What it means that it's a, what means channel, channel means that it's a lava flow generated channel because at the borders of the lava flow, lava becomes uh, colder and generate, uh, let's say, some barrier. And the lava flow within this barrier. And then it is uh, this barrier becomes more colder, colder and colder. And finally, they joined and create uh, big tubes, you know, that, and within these tubes, uh, lava flows. And finally, when the lava flow stops, these tubes uh, are preserved. And it is not only preserved for a short period of time. They are quite often preserved in geological time scale, generating, for example, the cars, you know, generating the not so, uh, uh, um, uh, caves, and the particularly that's the volcanic caves. And there are uh, experts that are dealing with the caves. They are going and finding such kind of uh, um, uh, caves, uh, cold volcanic caves or lava caves. Anyway, now I will start with this interaction of lava and its crust. And you see here is a simple example. When we had a, a, some, uh, let's say it is a model, it's a model flow inside of so-called the incline, uh, the channel. We developed this incline channel and we were quite interesting to see how the, uh, the uh, lava flows. And uh, another uh, issue which we uh, actually used, it, is, it was a first starting uh, the point to understand it, so how in general the lava flows within the uh, channel. And uh, well, well, okay, that's uh, here I will, I show you, uh, uh, I think it's uh, maybe one or two slides here uh, with uh, some formulas, but again, as usual, I mentioned, you have to understand, not just to enjoy the, uh, pictures or the movie, but understand how it comes uh, to, to uh, such a stage. And this is a uh, Navier-Stokes equation because flow here is a rather fast, and this term uh, should not be entirely neglected. Sometimes people neglect when the viscosity here is very high. It is a for domes, it is a it can be uh, neglected. But uh, in the case of the uh, small viscosity. This should not be neglected. That's why we use also the uh, there's a term, inertial term, so called. It's all this inertial term, and there is a point is that uh, in this case it is not a Stokes equation, but it's a Navier-Stokes equation. It's more complicated because of the uh, emphasis in the Stokes. And here it is an advection equation for density and viscosity, as I already mentioned. We used here as well. At the boundary condition, I am not going deeply in this case, it's just to show you the essence that's uh, essential governing equations. And there are some specific boundary conditions which relate, which, which creates the problem which we solve. Because sometimes people refer only to equations. Just to please remember the problem is equations together with the boundary and the initial conditions. And uh, here it is a lava flow with a broken. Uh, uh, crustal pieces, uh, crust of the lava, I mean, and uh, we wanted to generate such kind of things. That's why we generated uh, the mesh on the top of the lava flow. And we were interested to understand this is uh, uh, how, how the uh, this um, pieces deform and how they move. And look here, it is a, a lava which is penetrated. Look here, it's already the lava is uh, uh, cold and it's uh, uh, rather, rather hard. 
and the uh, new lava is just within this tube. You know, it uh, breaks this tube and it uh, goes down because it's the lava always moves on the, uh, you know, based on the criteria of the uh, highest steep, uh, st how, how uh, this uh, slope is, uh, um, how uh, steep is the slope. And it's based on this principle. And what we develop, we develop this such a form of the, at the same time, this uh, will uh, uh, introduce the uh, lava crust. And then the lava crust is moved upward together with the flow. And you can see that there is a red stuff somewhere here. It is a pieces which went down. Why? Because it's, you know, by end, when the red comes, sometimes the part of these pieces goes down and the more light material uh, tops the uh, things on the top. And uh, here you see that it's uh, one of the final example which looks uh, very similar to what in the nature you see. And again, that is a re red here under underneath of this uh, top. And here it is uh, some pieces which is uh, went down and stuck. Uh, they are uh, stuck uh, on the um, uh, uh, base of the uh, lava flow. Well, we developed also is a multi-phase fluid flow, which are, uh, ooh, it's, uh, yeah, multi-phase fluid flow from a single wind. And this is a, a single wind here was, it's a, a lava do uh, uh, the topography of the volcano, it went down. And then we used the also a new portion of the material and new portion of the material. Now, and this is a quite interesting work was, unfortunately, at that time, it was a very simple. Now we are thinking about the more complicated, the similar multi-phase fluid flow, but with the uh, temperatures, which is uh, close to the uh, reality and to see how the barriers are developed or how tube develop in the three-dimensional cases. That's a uh, rather complicated at time time consuming problem, but nevertheless it's a quite interesting problem. You see here there is a profile through these lines how this new portion comes on the top of the uh, the um, uh, older portions and how the structure are developed. And it can be compared through the geological, let's say, drilling and so on, how the layers of the um, um, lava are accumulated within the volcanoes. And here's some uh, issues. Uh, very briefly, a few words about this uh, Yellowstone uh, area. You know, it's a very famous Yellowstone, uh, the uh, so called this uh, old Yellowstone. Um, Volcano and uh, the very also interesting part. This is a summit lake where the lava flow formed the very huge, very big uh, the um, uh, area covered by the uh, lava, and it's uh, up to about two hundred meters the thick lava in the center. Uh, anyway, anyway, they say we also constructed this uh, special case and we investigated. I am going just a very uh, uh, fast here. This is a how it moved. This is a uh, area of the uh, lava which presently known and how in our case the lava moves with a different viscosity. That's why here it is a uh, less viscous. Here it's a more viscous. And you can see how it is rather well, they uh, start to cover this area down. Uh, I showed just a few examples, but now it's uh, within, within about the six to 12 months, its uh, area is uh, covered within the, if uh, uh, eruption uh, occurs so long a time, but it, it, it occur because it's uh, covers that's very thick. Well, that is the conclusion to this the first part, which I wanted to tell you. And this is, a, uh, you know, it is possible indeed to develop the numerical models, uh, which will be later used as a basis for uh, understanding the processes and then to help us in the inversions, which will be the next part, inversions related to the uh, lava uh, flow. And next part, I will start with the lava temperature and flow from its surface 
uh, thermal uh, measurements and um, uh, the shoulder its application or the patient data simulation in lava flow. Okay, now I stop and I give you uh, something like uh, uh, 10 minutes until uh, six and uh, then we will reconvene again. Okay, and yes, please, any question it's, uh, you can pose and I will look, uh, this is how um, I can answer and when I can answer. Okay, thank you, enjoy your break. <laughs>